they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men, and who came to the young world after the sniff. Welcome to the Great Old Ones Gaming Podcast. I am your host, Innkeeper Vase Odin, and with me today is... I'm Nate, lost in time and space. And we have a very special guest with us today as we talk about how to play Delta Green, Mr. Dennis Detwiller. Dennis, welcome back, man. How are you guys doing? Awesome. It's, it's awesome to have you back with us again. We had such a good conversation last time. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, no, I had a great time talking with you. Yeah, so today, um, last time we talked about like the origins of Delta Green and your history and background. Uh, today we wanted to talk about um, how to play Delta Green. And to start it off, I wanted to to go into what exactly is Delta Green? So Delta Green is a, a, a game about uh, a, a conspiracy within the federal government uh, that investigates the paranormal and the unnatural uh, as related to the kind of the works of H.P. Lovecraft. So inhuman otherworldly forces are trying to break through to destroy the world and your agents secretly investigate and cover these things up because you know uh, that exposure of these things on a wide scale will drive people insane and or end the world. Um, and it, this this investigation and, and uh, discovery leads to horrible consequences for the agents involved uh, with their families, with their lives. They slowly fall apart because these things are so horrific uh, to understand and see that they go mad. Yeah, I, I read in the, well, it, I think in the first chapter of the uh, player's handbook, uh, it, it basically states that Delta Green is about the demise of huma- humanity. And I think you summed it up pretty well there. Um, so Delta Green started as a as a part of Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing game, because they're, they're kind of linked to the Cthulhu mythos in a way, but it does differ quite a bit. Uh, can you briefly tell us how some of the things are different for Delta Green versus Call of Cthulhu? Delta Green grew over time until it kind of became its own thing. And um, we, we kind of, we're still buddies with Chaosium and Lynn Willis, the, the former uh, guy who ran Chaosium. You know, we worked out a deal where we kind of went off on our own. And um, Delta Green is more about the human cost than the classic Call of Cthulhu. Uh, game. This is more about how these these things, these secrets, these horrors prey upon not only your agent, but those that your agent loves, your your, your agent's wife, your agent's nine-year-old child. Um, how, how does it affect their relationship? How does it destroy that family over time where you're hiding these horrible secrets? Um, so there's a deep focus on psychological horror here that is not usually evident in, in the classic Call of Cthulhu, which is like Come on, detective, let's go bust this ghost in a building. <laughs> yeah, it's it, Call of Cthulhu, I see more like a, a monster movie versus Delta Green, which is more like a psychological horror. And in my opinion, Delta Green is, is true horror. It's the most horrific game that I've ever played. And I think part of it is it touches on, it's not scared. You guys aren't scared to touch on adult concepts and themes. Um, you don't shy away from topics like death of children and sexual deviancy and other taboo topics and things like that. No, we, I mean, we want to reflect the real world, um, which is one of the kind of the key components of Delta Green. There, there is horror, there's unnatural horror and things that are beyond mankind. But those things exist at the periphery uh, of of the world. And finding those things is not something you do every mission. It's not something you do every session. You know, you don't see a monster of the week. Um, yeah. and this is much more, there's a lot of digging involved to get to the point where you might see something like that. And trust me, when you make it there, it doesn't at all feel like a good idea to be there. Um, and that's kind of the key to Delta Green is that is an extremely deadly game system on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think, um, part of it is the setting is, is generally modern times. I mean, there's the fall of Delta Green, which takes place in like the sixties. Um, but, um, But this game, generally, most operations take place uh, in modern times. And I think it's easier to, as a player, to put yourself in the position of the agent. And when you do encounter something like that, I mean, it's easy to to see what you or or play out what you would actually do. Whereas something like Call of Cthulhu or Dungeons and Dragons, you're like, I'm just going to shoot at it. I'm going to fight it anyways. Yeah, there's a level of detachment, you know, uh, possible when you're imagining the 1920s or you know, Greyhawk, 
Um, but when you're, you know, <laughs> in the middle of a, a, a gun battle with inhuman cultists in like a dentist's office in Reseda, uh, and you know, you land behind the table dodging gunfire and there's like a Britney Spears people magazine cover on the floor. <laughs> Everything feels much more real and relatable and weird. And, um, so the horror really stands out against the everyday world. Yeah. And, um, and we talked about the, uh, the setting being modern times there. Basically the, the game revolves around agents, right? Generally the, the players are, are federal agents or federal employees that are kind of involved in this government conspiracy but there are other ways to to play the game uh, where you don't necessarily have to be agents. Can you tell us about the few different uh, ways to get into that? We've produced a, a bunch of content that that goes in different directions. One one of my favorites is um, there's there's a web uh, in the game. There's a web and television program called Phenomenex, um, which is this you know like the the classic cheesy Mothman of Point Pleasant. <laughs> Kind of, except these poor guys are on, are honestly used by the conspiracy as canaries in a coal mine. So Delta Green will ring up and say, you know, go to this address to see if something eats them. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so you can play you can play as these poor schlubs on a web TV program who accidentally are being used as a like a cattle prod to test stuff for Delta Green uh, without even knowing what you're getting involved in, seeing real occult and unnatural stuff. Uh, and slowly being kind of sucked into the secret world. Um, we, we quite like that one. Um, also, you know, friendlies exist in Delta Green, which is just experts who are um, somehow swept into an unnatural investigation, say a linguist or, you know, an archaeologist or an anthropologist, and they're brought into the conspiracy and told whatever the conspiracy wants to tell them. Oh, we're official or, oh, we're... You know, we're just these three guys. We're not a agency. We just do this because we can't let, you know, the thing that got let loose on those Sumerian tablets kill people anymore. No one will believe us. Um, so there's a lot of ways in. You don't necessarily have to play a federal agent to, to play in any of these things. Yeah, and there's a supplement called The Complex where uh, you guys uh, give the option to create an agent, well, not agent, but a character who works for like a government contractor, like these arms dealers. And um, and there's also The Outlaws. What are The Outlaws? So so in the original Delta Green, the, the, the organization was, Delta Green was closed in 1970 officially. Um, but the, those who ran Delta Green decided this is too important. We're going to keep doing it secretly. And they, they did it in, in something called the Cowboy Organization, which was just them uh, pinging other Delta Green members that they knew to investigate things on the fly secretly. So it was an illegal conspiracy. And then in the modern era, um, the leaders of the illegal conspiracy broke up into two separate groups. There are the outlaws who are continue that illegal conspiracy. And then there's the program. And the program is an official federally funded hyper secret organization that uh, destroys unnatural threats. Uh, and they buy their, their freedom by providing exotic technology and information uh, to the federal government at the highest levels. And they're, they're incredibly secret, but they're very, very, very well funded. So there are two Delta Greens, uh, the Cowboys, uh, the Outlaws, who think they're they're the only ones in the right, and the program, who think, of course, we need the force of the federal government behind us to be able to do this. Um, sometimes they're at odds, and sometimes they work together, um, but there's a, a clear split there. And what's interesting, too, is that the players may not necess necessarily know which faction that they're a part of, because the handler is kind of an unreliable narrator, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we we wanted to ask Dennis what, like what what would be the difference between playing other RPGs versus playing Delta Green, and what aspects of the theater of the mind are most important when playing Delta Green? Sure. Um, so Del Delta Green is is about success in the face of almost guaranteed failure. That is the joy of Delta Green for me. Um, it, it, it's it's that moment where even though you've died in the last seven missions, that one time when you brought the book to the altar at the right time and said the spell and sent the howling thing back through the void, um, that moment lives on uh, because it's so important and it's so easy to lose your agent 
you know, you can die horribly in this game. And in fact, you know, gunfire, explosions, that kind of stuff, murder, it's all extremely easy to end an agent's life in the game. Um, and it's built that way because it makes those moments feel much more interesting and much more memorable when you do succeed. So it's all about that that kind of magic moment. There's a great example. I ran a game called Visid for Ken Heights and Ooh, I love that scenario. Yeah, and and at the end of that scenario, only one agent remained alive, and she had been gut shot, was in the <laughs> hospital um, after like a 19-hour surgery, and she knew the bodies that were tainted with this horrible stuff were in the basement, in the morgue, and she struggled, you know, to crawl out of bed with stitching, tearing stitching from all these operations to get downstairs to burn the bodies and uh, cover it up. And she collapsed and almost died down there. But everybody at the table, who were all dead, were, <laughs> were, were applauding and just shouting and freaking out, like, please make this roll. And she did it. And it was just uh, an incredible moment that had nothing to do with really monsters being there and attacking or anything. It was a much more human moment of, I'm going to risk everything to try and stop this from spreading further. And it was just awesome. Moments like that are why Delta Green kind of stands out for me. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So now that we've done a kind of an overview of Delta Green and the actual um, setting of the game, let's talk about the flow of an operation. There's Without getting into like too many spoilers, I'll mention a few operations. Um, so basically, f- from my experience playing a few operations in Delta Green, they're kind of um, broken down into like three, three phases. Um, the first one is the Delta Green involvement, like the first, usually an event occurs with hints of supernatural influence. So agents are sent in. Generally, you don't um, like you don't know exactly what's going on. So it starts off usually either as a law enforcement procedural or a scientific anomaly or agents. There's certain operations where agents aren't with Delta Green yet, so they're kind of thrust into it by some event that occurs. So those are the three ways that usually that Delta Green I've seen gets involved. Now, with the law enforcement procedural portion, I have a degree in forensic investigations. I have a bachelor's degree, and I'm really impressed with you guys, with how you guys handle the the procedural part of the game. Like, have you guys uh, done a lot of research? I'm assuming you have, or do one of you guys have some kind of... Uh, we, you know, we're really lucky. We have... So so a great example of just kind of the level of research is um, for combat and such, we, we, you know, we have a Marine major who, you know, has done three tours. We have a Navy intelligence officer who just came in and tweaked our combat until it kind of felt right. Same thing with the, the law enforcement stuff. Shane has a, you know... Uh, Shane was uh, tried to become an FBI agent, but but uh, was was basically restricted from being it because of some you know smoking pot or something when he was in high school. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> so, so uh, but we have many many um, you know relationships with a lot of skilled people. You know, for, uh, we have a a, a, bi- a biologist who does all of our biology stuff. And, you know, law enforcement, same thing. We, we, we know a lot of law enforcement officials. We float this stuff by them. And, um, you know, if they kick really hard, uh, you know, oh, my God, that has to change. We definitely change it. We always listen. So I think that's kind of what's that, – that's why it seems like that to you. It's great. It's one of my favorite parts of the game is that, that beginning where you're just starting to discover thing and as And you guys have a good way of, like, injecting certain clues – as you're discovering stuff or investigating a scene where it's very slow, like the feeding of information, you quickly start gathering or you slowly start gathering information that starts to put things into your mind. Like something is just not right about this. And it's, it's great because as a player, I think they can, they feel like they're the ones that are discovering this, you know, they're. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important. Um, Subtlety is another big thing with Delta Green is that, that, you know, it sounds over the top when you kind of summarize it, but when you actually read the books, um, all of this stuff, obviously these unnatural forces, they haven't broken through on national TV or anything like that. They have to be subtle. Um, and, and they start off small and they grow. Um, so spoon feeding this stuff to the, the players in larger and larger amounts is kind of the key 
to the game as they unlock these clues. And they, they should start small. Um, people tend to overshoot and just, you know, it goes to a Michael Bay movie in scene two. Um, and we, you know, it's really important not to do that because otherwise you don't get this kind of mounting dread or fear of uh, negative repercussion by jumping ahead as a player. Players will just march in guns a blazing if it feels like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Delta Green feels best when the agents are arguing, should we go to this site? You know, and I, I love that. It feels it feels real. Yeah, so the a few uh, examples of operations that start with some kind of investigation or procedural type. Um, Ex Oblivione, which we're playing, it's fantastic uh, operation. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, operation Night Floors, that one's another one that, that we played that was really good. It's a missing persons case is how it starts. Um, then there's the scientific anomalies. You have uh, Observer Effect, uh, which is fantastic. We haven't played that one yet. Uh, but I really, really, I read through it and it's, it blew my mind. Um, Sick Again is another one that starts kind of as a scientific anomaly, uh, an extremophilia. Um, and then the ones where agents aren't quite Delta Green yet, Control. there's pretty much every operation in the book Control Group. Um, some fantastic intro operations, and those are great um, as intro scenarios. So if you're getting into Delta Green, and you haven't played an operation yet, and your player, you're not sure how your players are going to handle it. The the scenarios in Control Group are a great way to get people into Delta Green who haven't played before. Yeah, yeah. Greg Stoltze designed those scenarios specifically to kind of this is this is the jump off point for your your character to become an agent in Delta Green. These scenarios kind of march you through that then so the that's the first part generally of most operations one of those three um then in the second part usually the the agents have discovered some kind of conspiracy or they start suspecting that um and i found you you touched on it earlier uh but also something that i find great about the operations is the mythos is kind of a plot device and it's a kind of in the background it's always lingering there but generally, the antagonists usually are like the humans who are trying to use the mythos for their own plots and conspiracies. Yeah, I mean, and this is this goes back to Lovecraft, right? If you look at Lovecraft's stories, you know, it's 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 human agents uh, doing these things mostly. There are monsters, of course, but they are at the again at the periphery. So th this is a very conscious choice. It's it's humans dealing with humans most of most of the time in, in Delta Green. Um, and that's an important, you know, decision that we made very early on is that 99% of what you'll see is, uh, human greed and things you can understand. And then that 1% floating out there that can destroy you is, is just, it could be anywhere. And, uh, that's the, 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 the unnatural mythos. And we love that stuff too. But yeah, it feels like Delta green makes it feel like it's more, like the mythos is more of a personification of people's worst traits rather than like being an actual physical manifestation, which I, which I find particularly interesting. So, so as you're actually going through the flow of the operation, you know how is how are um, how is health and sanity dealt with in Delta Green? So you know health uh, is just uh, hit, you know standard hit points is kind of how we deal with health. You know everybody understands. Uh, I'm sure listening to this podcast, everybody understands the basic concept of hit points. Um, sanity is a, is a little bit different. Um, we we uh, use sanity points, kind of like hit points, but um, there are different types of sanity uh, draining concepts. There's the unnatural. There's violence, um, there's helplessness. Um, so violence would be, you know, it's a sanity cost if I come upon a butchered body. Helplessness might be I'm tortured by cultists for days, while the unnatural is, you know, anything outside of you, the, the realm of human conception, uh, unnatural monsters, that kind of stuff. Um, and those are all handled kind of separately. Violence and helplessness, you can become hardened to, meaning my agent can become somewhat detached from losing sanity for violence if I was, say, a, a four-tour veteran of war. Um, but it has other negative effects. It makes relationships more difficult and social roles more difficult. Same thing with helplessness. 
you know, I, I was tortured my entire life until I was 13 and now it doesn't really affect me as negatively as it might affect a normal person. But again, it destroys other portions of the game for that agent. Um, so, that, you know, on a high level, that's kind of how we handle it. Um, but there's an entire other section called Home Life and Bonds, which connect directly to sanity. Um, these are the relationships in your lives and that kind of stuff. And then going going into the, um, you know, so we, we talked about Delta Green's involvement, and then as the agents progress through the scenario, they begin to uncover this uh, this conspiracy. But towards the end, you know, all hell just breaks loose, and you know, you eventually you get to the top of the roller coaster, to put it in Ken's words, and then you immediately you take this just drastic plunge. Yeah, and you know, we, we kind of touched on it earlier, but combat is very deadly. But what about? Um, what about the types of equipments that the agents can can use? Um, you know, the, obviously there's like guns and weapons and things like that too, but there's also resources that players may not initially think of, like being able to call in, um, you know, like backup from from their department or what have you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on a, on a high level, there there is always a, a, an almost comedic obsession on equipment. With, with characters. They're like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to get a Barrett sniper rifle and I'm going to do this. And, um, and, and the best way to, to think about Delta Green is you are covering your tracks as you're doing it. So, you know, very early on, agents try lots of things and very, <laughs> by their mid-career, the agents are like, we can't bring anything with us. We could be stopped if we're carrying, you know, armor-piercing rounds because we know there's some horrible thing in the woods and we get stopped by the local sheriff, are we going to kill the sheriff and bury him? Or is he going to report us to the news or what the hell, you know? Um, so there's a lot of equipment choices, just like the real world. Um, but truth be told, against the unnatural threats, like, you know, some horrible thing from beyond with a thousand tentacles, the the choice between an MP4 and a, you know, an AR-15 on full auto isn't really going to make much of a difference. Um, and players learn that very quickly. Um, so uh, there, there is a, there tends to be a player, uh, an inordinate amount of player attention given to equipment. Uh, calling in backup and such for the program is possible. Uh, you can kind of call in favors and depending on how big you want to go. But again, even those things, even a Hellfire missile might not help. Um, the scale of these threats are just so vast and inhuman that uh, they're difficult to conceive, much less destroy. Mm -hmm. And not only that too, but obviously you're, you know, you're pulling, you're pulling strings with your, with your bureaucratic skills too, which can have long lasting consequences. Yeah. Well. I mean, any, any of these things could blow up into an, uh, a congressional investigation. You know, why, why was a black Hawk, you know, with live ordnance diverted from Edwards air force base in the middle of the night? And why did it fire on a, you know, uh, model homes in the middle of New Jersey. Um, you know, right. Right. suddenly, you know, they're checking phone records and your agent's burner cell phone comes up five times. And, you know, <laughs> you know, we've had scenarios where it's just basically, it devolves into cover up everything because they're on their way. Um, just because you're a part of the federal government at the highest level doesn't mean uh, you're immune to prosecution. And in fact, the, the program will send you up the river, just like the, the outlaws will, to cover up the existence of the group from the public because what they know is so dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, So prison time is a very real possibility for an agent. Yeah. So, so Dennis, how do, um, how do skills actually work in Delta Green? Because that's, that's a large portion of actually playing the game for the players. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, skill, skill rolls are, you know, it's a D100 system. Uh, if you've played Call of Cthulhu or any of the BRP systems, you'll be very familiar with it, uh, or ICE or anything like that. Um, and basically you can use a skill without a roll if, if the situation is kind of calm and, and, you know, you're not under any threat and you have enough of a skill that the handler judges this is okay. You have, you know, electrician at 40%. Um, and you want to look at you know, the wiring of a house, you don't even have to roll. The, the handler will just describe to you what's going on and you kind of move on. If you're being shot at and trying to examine the same electrical uh, panel, you'd have to roll the dice. Um, and, you know, basically, you know, you want to roll under and win. 
you know, that just basically means a success. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, that, that's basically on a high level. That's how those operate. It's, it's, it's very right. simple. You'll recognize it immediately if you played the games. And there's critical success and critical failure as well. So a critical, how, how does a critical success what, what does someone need to roll? Well, a critical success is a, is a you know, you roll a one on any skill or uh, any roll where the dice match under the skill level. So if, if your skill was 50% and you got a critical, uh, you know, a critical might be a zero one, an 11, a 33, a 44. And it means it automatically succeeds beyond all expectations and kind of just on a high level, it's twice as good as an ordinary success. It's just kind of a, like a a baseline for the handler. Uh, and then on the other end, there's a fumble. And a fumble uh, is just a critical failure. It's a, you know, you roll zero, zero or, or doubles beyond your skill. So if you had 50%, you know, you roll a 77 or a 99 or a zero, zero, that's a fumble and it always fails. Um, and uh, it has catastrophic consequences. So, you know, if you're under fire and checking out the electrical panel, uh, you zap yourself or all the lights go out or something like that, you know, um, but it's up to the handler. And you guys uh, in your system, one thing that I really liked about these skills is you actually have a breakdown of what they actually mean by percentage. So if someone has a skill below or 19% or below, they're just a dabbler in that in that thing. So if I have a 5% in forensics, you know, I may have watched some forensic show or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was have a, a high level handler read of a skill. So if the hand, if the handler asks you a skill and you're like, I'm 30 percent, they go, oh, you know, it's about this good uh, because we have that no role rule um, for when things are not hectic or in severe doubt. So if you're if you're in a investigation and you want to be able to pull a fingerprint and your your skill level is a 45%, that 45% equals years of experience or a college major. So you should be able to handle that without even having to roll. Yeah, the handler would just hand wave that. You know, um, if, if you were trying to find, you know, trying to pull fingerprints from, uh, you know, a, a, a just a bloodied, covered in viscera crime scene, you would probably have to roll. You know, if there were guts everywhere, um, but otherwise, you know, not a big deal um, for you. You've done this before. Um, and we really want to build that into the system at the core because what we want is agents to feel kind of accomplished at what they, they know. So when they spend on skills, buying to a certain degree actually makes a lot of sense, especially when you're not under fire. Mm -hmm. And um, touching on um, um, Call of Cthulhu briefly, they have a, a luck system. So a lot of people that come from Call of Cthulhu, they want to know about the luck system. But with Delta Green, it's just a 50-50 chance, right? Yeah. You know, like one of the things that, that we really believe is that, uh, you know, the Lovecraftian world is, is soulless and without uh, any special feeling for humanity. Humanity is utterly expendable. Um, when we call for a luck roll, you just roll a D100 and, you know, if you roll under 50, it's it's on. If you roll over, over 50, it's not. And, um, you know, we removed all elements like bennies and, uh, you know, points where you can kind of alter the outcome of the story. That's just not what Delta Green's about. Um, it, it's, it's about the, you know, the relentless horror of the universe gobbling up humanity. It's not about, you know, I get to be the, the you know, the commando style hero from a 1980s action film. So uh, speaking of skills, someone can be skilled in firearms and um, that kind of leads us into the into combat. Combat is something that uh, some RPGs are really heavy on. Delta Green clearly is, if you're in combat, uh, there's a very, very big chance that uh, some of you are not gonna come out alive as we've mentioned several times here. Um, but there is still a system for combat in Delta Green and it starts with the combat rounds. Uh, how, do, how do you go about doing initiative? Most games you roll initiative to see who goes first, but not in Delta Green. No, we, okay. just, we just do it, uh, you know, whatever the dex, uh, dexterity stat for your character or monster is, that we just go from highest to lowest. Um, it just works out easier. Um, so much of the fiddliness uh, in so many combat systems, in our opinion, that we wanted to build against um, so much of that fiddliness subtracts 
from the feeling which is generated by that combat system. So the target for our combat system is a, a universe that is uncaring and unflinching towards humanity. And we used, you know, our Marine major who, you know, had been in combat for better part of a decade. He just basically looked at the system and said, here's how you can tweak it. You know, uh, he, he, I, my favorite comment of his was, he said, um, if you drop a Tomahawk cruise missile in the game on a hotel, somebody should be able to walk out of that hotel uh, relatively unhurt with their ears blown and blood pouring out of their nose, but they're going to live. Uh, and wow. I said, I said, how the hell is that possible? He said, I don't know, but I've seen it. <laughs> um, you know, and, and again, the, he basically said, you know, g- gunplay is the most dangerous, most instantaneous, terrifying thing that, that he can imagine. And that, you know, if a pistol comes out, everybody in that room could be dead in seconds. Um, and this is just a reality. So we really want to build that in from the core of the game system. Um, so kind of that's how we started thinking about it. So so a common military tactic is to lay down suppression fire to, you know, to help your agents get to where they need to go. How does how does that, that work exactly in Delta Green? Yeah, well, we we. Um, do suppressing fire uh, in kind of a, it depends on the weapon you're using. So you, you want kind of a, you want to be firing a a, a semi-automatic or an automatic weapon that, you know, fires in bursts and, and just kind of covering an area. And basically you, you roll against the skill. um, You can miss, but within a radius still kind of suppress someone from acting. And when you're suppressed, you, you can choose to kind of attack and lose sanity, just being terrified of standing up in the middle of a spray of bullets um, or, or dive for cover, you know? Um, so that's kind of how we handle that. We want to keep it simple, um, but weapons have a kill radius that kind of covers an area for, for uh, suppression purposes. Uh, since you mentioned kill radius, there's kill damage and kill radius. So um, that's usually like grenades and, and big heavy weapons and stuff. So how does kill damage and kill radius work uh, mechanically? Yeah, so one of the things we really didn't like in, in kind of earlier systems was like, roll your 24d6 damage, uh, you know. <laughs> roll to hit from the 19 bullets that come out of the machine gun against the target, roll 19 times and then roll 24, six damage. We, we didn't want that. So what, what we did was work with this kind of Marine and uh, Greg Stolte had a great idea where he was just kind of like, uh, okay, so if you're hit with this type of weapon and you're within this radius, um, so say 10 meters, uh, you roll uh, a lethality rating and a lethality rating will be something like 3% or 30% Below the percentage is an instant kill. Yeah, so if you below if you roll below the percentage, you're you're you drop to zero hit points, and if you fail, you roll two d tens and take those as hit points damage. So either way, you can die because <laughs> two d tens is still pretty deadly. <laughs> it's very deadly. Uh, but what we wanted to imitate here was, you know, uh, RPG is launched on your position. Chances are you're not gonna just be skipping away from that. And in older systems. You can roll a one or, you know, you, you roll roll 12 <laughs> D6 and you roll, you know, 12 and you have 14 hit points. You're fine. Uh, you can still go. Um, we really want to feel deadly and strange um, and also kind of random. Um, and also we want to cover many targets in a single roll. That makes sense. So, Dennis, um, you know, while, while firearms and explosives may be very deadly, you know, with regardless of the agent's control, hand-to-hand combat is a bit of a different animal. How does that work in Delta Green? Uh, well, hand-to-hand combat is is kind of a, you know, when you're going with, um, we, we wanted it to feel um, kind of quick and, and you wanted to kind of understand on a high level what was happening without getting super detailed, you know what I mean? Um, so we, we didn't want to go, you know, deep into like, here's the 33 rolls. Um, so kind of what we ended up with is I believe it's a, it's a contest between, um, unarmed combat ratings. And you can also, there are also things like moves where you you want to grapple or there's a lot of different options in there, but basically 
on a high level, it's, it's a contest between skills. Um, whoever rolls the best kind of wins that outcome and moves on. Or, you know, if you're just punching in kind of opposed tests, it's just kind of like you succeed or fail and do damage. I love that you can uh, you can act before your turn if you're in hand-to-hand, -hand, like someone punches you, you can counterattack or try to dodge the blow. It, it makes co combat a little bit more interesting and a little more dynamic. Yeah, we definitely wanted, um, when you're fighting back or dodging or something like that, we wanted that built into the system. So it's, it's not... Uh, a target's acting upon you and you have no options. Um, especially, you know, you have to know they're there, obviously. But, you know, dodging or fighting back becomes an important part of a choice. You could have your gun out waiting for your turn to fire in combat and someone just blindsides you and suddenly you're fighting them. Um, you're not waiting for your turn to fight them. You're, you're actually doing a defense role right then. So we kind of wanted that. All right, now for our favorite favorite topic sanity <laughs> so sanity is a huge part of delta green as with most lovecraftian type games uh sanity is um it's got its own set of rules and there are a bunch of little things that can affect it or that you can use as tools for repressing it so we're kind of we're going to break it down um but first what does sanity, what does a ch sanity check represent in the game? So if you if you ask an agent to roll for a sanity check, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I gotta edit that part. The dog went crazy. Um, so what does a sanity check represent as far as in real life when you make that roll? So it, a, a sanity check would be something horrific or terrifying. So, so the three examples uh, of types of sanity losses I gave you, violence, helplessness, and unnatural. Violence would be, you know, the horrors of warfare or seeing someone get their head blown off in front of you. Uh, helplessness would be torture or losing control of a situation on a fundamental level to the point at where it's terrifying to you. Um, and unnatural is everything outside of human experience that literally can't be understood. Um, if you know what I mean, like uh, Cthulhu or something like that. And when I say it's very important that the person uh, listening to this understand that these things are beyond human conception. They cannot be understood. Um, so when you see some horror from beyond, I'm not talking about, you know, an alien or a monster from a monster movie. I'm talking about something that is fundamentally beyond human conception. It's so alien you can't classify or understand it. Um, so that would be the unnatural. Mm -hmm. So so when exactly would uh, a handler ask to to have their agents make a sanity check? Um, you know, when, when, when so usually when suddenly presented with some horror. Um, so, you know, you open the room and uh, there, there are 200 cut up bodies stacked like cordwood. That would be a violence check against sanity. Um, now, some agents, like I said earlier, might be hardened to violence and they look in the room and they go, this, this is just like Kabul. You know, <laughs> and they walk mm -hmm. away. <laughs> well, while the other guy who, you know, is an archaeologist or something has to roll full sanity or be just terrified. Um, and uh, the negative outcomes of these things are lasting mental illnesses and or deteriorations of bonds who are kind of your family and friends. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you kind of touched on it just there that sanity is, you know, it's not just a, just a check in this game. There is, there's also your willpower and your bonds, like you mentioned, and you can, you can kind of project, your, you know, your loss of sanity either through your willpower or into your bonds. So how, do, how does that exactly work, Dennis? Yeah, yeah. So the, the bond thing is probably the most important thing. And that's basically you can destroy your relationships <laughs> in lieu of taking sanity damage. So, you know, if you were going to lose some sanity, you could instead uh, decide to ruin, you know, your a nine relationship with your wife and reduce it to eight or whatever. Um, and, and the way that would be reflected in game is your relationship with your wife becomes more and more, uh, your, your agent's relationship with their wife becomes more and more tenuous because you're hiding stuff and you're waking up from nightmares. And, but on the upside, you don't lose those sanity points and, <laughs> uh, and willpower, um, willpower is just a general measure of force of will that the agent has. And this is used in the operation of, uh, hypergeometry and other magics. 
Um, and you can spend willpower to kind of offset certain sanity costs, like um, being terrified in, in a firefight or something like that. So, so what actually happens to an agent when they when they go temporarily insane? Well, there's there's a couple kind of um, there's a couple standard outcomes which you can kind of uh, imagine these things as a real life thing where you completely give in to the horror and and just check out. You just become paralyzed or catatonic. Um, you freak out. Um, you know, is another option where you just decide you're just going to attack your way out of this um, or you just run. And that's the most common option is that agents just go. Um, and I don't know how many games I've been in where half the team just sees whatever the big baddie is and is like, you know what? Peace out. I'm gone. <laughs> uh, they fail their role and they just run for it. And, you know, what happened to Carl? He was the last one there shooting at it and you never see <laughs> Carl again. We had something like that happen in our uh, Ex Oblivion game in yeah, part one yeah. last week. <laughs> yeah, it's quite it's quite a common outcome. So there's another thing called breaking point. Do you mind if I talk about that? Oh yeah, go uh, for yeah. It. First, the temporary insanity, just for mechanical purposes. If you lose five points of sanity or more in one roll or in one check, is when you go temporarily insane. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know, and and to give you an idea of scale. That's a relatively middling sanity role for, especially for the unnatural threats. That's something pretty basic. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the agents have hardened responses towards violence because they've been in law enforcement for 20 years or were combat veterans. Or, so that doesn't often come up. And you can still lose sanity from violence even if you're adapted, it's just less. Oh yeah, yeah, you, you just, you end up losing less and sometimes you can shrug off certain things that would really disturb others. Um, but again, it has negative consequences on social interactions and bonds and things like that. Um, but on a high level, there's something called a breaking point, which is basically your sanity score. I believe it's minus your, your power score. Um, and it's just a number. If you hit that point, uh, you, your brain changes and you, you, you kind of, you kind of develop a permanent disorder that, that tries to help your agent cope with the situation. And when I say this, like on a high level, you can it can be almost anything, but it could be an addiction, it could be fear of loud noises, it could be utter paranoia, it could be PTSD. All of these things are kind of simulated in the system, sleep disorder, um, you know, anxiety disorder, conversion disorder. Um, and these are all deeply researched as well. Um, and they're all by type. So unnatural violence, helplessness, each has kind of a, a range of disorders your character might develop. And these things kind of take over your life over time. Um, they're, they're difficult to deal with on agents. I mean, imagine a federal agent who's terrified of loud noises um, to the point where they, they suffer a, a flee or a submit response when, when they're exposed to gunfire or something like that. Um, so these things, you know, become more and more difficult to deal with over time and they can stack. So that that's what happens when you cr you kind of crash past your breaking point. And as your character, you know, as they go past their breaking point, they tend to lose a lot of their motivations as well. And and how does how would that be represented in game, Dennis? Well, motivations are kind of a high level concept uh, that, you know, the handler can take as deep as they want. But but on a high level. Uh, you know, almost everybody you know is driven by some internal motivations. You know, protect the innocents, do a good job, look after my family, that kind of stuff. And you kind of stack those. And those things can be destroyed over time uh, as well, um, especially as the bonds disintegrate. Um, there are rules for all this in the game. It's kind of hard to explain, but basically uh, on a high level, it's a very simple system. And that was kind of the key. Uh, bonds, you know, just track on a high level. I have a nine relationship with my wife. I have a three relationship with my son who hates me. I have a, you know, uh, a 10 <laughs> relationship with my other agent um, because we know secrets together and, you know, we're trustworthy. And I can use those bonds to kind of regain and re refill myself at the end of these missions. Um, those relationships give me strength. I love the bonds mechanic. I think it's such an interesting way to develop you know, your character, give them more, like flesh them out more. And the mechanical aspects of it are, 
I mean, it's really easy to envision what's happening. You know, like when you when you roll a sanity roll, you can actually project um, to a bond. So, like, you can think about your father. That's one of your bonds. As as you're witnessing somebody getting shot, you just think about your dad, and it helps you retain your sanity because you want to stay alive for your father. But then, next time you see your father, you you lose points when you do that. When you project, you lose points in that bond. So next time you go see your dad. It, you're kind of withdrawn from them a little bit because now you've associated that that loss of sanity or that moment with your father. So next time you see him, you're thinking about that person getting shot and you're you're a little more distant from them and you've lost a little bit of that. It's it's amazing how simple it is, but it works so well. Oh, yeah, um, thanks. Yeah, Shane worked really hard on it. And um, it, it basically, it's just, it's kind of like, a you know, your relationships in the world are a shield against all the horrors that you see. And you kind of have to wear them down to, to kind of survive, you know. But you can also use your bonds for for other purposes. You can use, if you have a bond, let's say you have an ex-military contact, um, you can, your bond score can actually be used for trying to get stuff out of them. So like information or maybe a favor from whatever place they work at, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, you can, um, you know, if, if you're buddies from the war you know <laughs> you know you have a 10 bond with them you can you know you ring them up and remember that guy you knew who could get those rockets I need, you know i need this <laughs> um and that can damage the bond as well you know so imagine a real world situation like that where you're talking to uh you know uh, a major or, or a captain in the army asking him to gain access to illegal stuff for you based on your huge and deep relationship together at the war in the war um and at the end of that he might get you the stuff but you might also burn a couple points in the bond relationship um just because yeah. you're risking you're putting his life at risk yeah it's, it's a it's a mechanical way to burn the bridge so to speak but you you can also recover sanity too you can go through psychotherapy and all that stuff too which i also find really interesting yeah you know we, we thought it was really important to kind of reflect that, that working on yourself can have positive changes. You can, you know, during downtime, you can do all manner of things that kind of restore, you know, your, your, your life to normal. Um, psychotherapy is kind of a, a two-edged sword because unless you're entirely truthful, you don't really gain the benefit. And then you're talking to a, an individual outside of the conspiracy about horrible things. Um, right. That they might just think you're insane and lock you up. So it's a very difficult road to tread uh, but it's fun like playing that out is quite fun <laughs> yeah i like d that delta green has this whole separate sort of um like vignette i think it's described in in the actual uh, agent's handbook that you actually can play out these you know these sorts of like cutaway scenes after or before before a particular uh, operation and and that kind of really helps to develop not only your agent, but, you know, you as a group and... Oh, yeah. And as a campaign, which, I, you know, we, we touched on it earlier. It, it is kind of sort of a trope in Lovecraftian games that the protagonists always, you know, always die or go insane or what have you. But, but in Delta Green, you know, there's a lot more little nuances and switches that you can kind of mess around with. Oh, yeah, what? yeah. I mean, yeah, it was one of the main drives was to... What we really want, like a great example was, you know, we did a little vignette where everybody just kind of explained their family situation, their bond situation before they went off on a mission. And um, one of the players just mentioned, oh, you know, he's obsessed with Facebook. It's all about his family on Facebook and blah, blah, blah. And I had him make a luck roll midway through the mission. And his, you know, when he posted to Facebook, he actually mentioned this as a character thing. Um, and he was hiding from his wife. He's literally saying, oh, I'm here, but he's actually states away doing something else and uh when he posted to facebook it posted the geotag and, oh, and, she, yeah. she's, and I, I was just like okay here we go this is where this scenario is going now like your wife of 12 years <laughs> knows you're in illinois and not in california like you're supposed to be on a training thing that's awesome um and it just, just generated from there he was just like oh my god you know <laughs> um yeah it was great so it's a little it's a little what i love about vignettes is they're simple they're not this in involved nightmare of role playing where everybody else gets glassy eyed and bored while you explore interesting things to you and nobody else. It's kind of a high level summary. And that's before and after the scenario. Um, 
is kind of how we do it. Yeah, and if you were playing with, you know, maybe like one or two other other players, like, you know, you have a handler and two agents, you, you could really draw those scenes out if you really wanted to, too, which is also really interesting. And, um, yeah, like, like we said, you know, it's not... It's not entirely that your characters are definitely going to go insane or definitely going to die at the end of the scenario. So, so developing those those bonds and motivations not only serve a, a narrative purpose, but they serve a mechanical purpose. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we felt that was important um, because th- there are two, you know, lar- high level types of players. There, there are there are those people who are just obsessed with the mechanics and want want to kind of get the best outcome in a mechanical game. And we want to kind of lure those guys in to the point where they start thinking about their agent as a person. Um, we didn't want to alienate them by just having these abstracts that you can't really measure. And the other side, we have the deep role-playing guys. And we kind of want to bring these guys together into a pool in the center where they're both accidentally playing the other method of gaming and they just don't realize it. Um, because mechanically, the mechanical guy is obsessed with all these numbers and they realize the way to game this is to explain what's actually going on with their agent. <laughs> so we're kind of trying to trick them into becoming more avid role players. And on the other side, we're kind of making the mechanicals si- simple so the hardcore role players become engaged with them. And with um, with with all this um, specific with the home scenes and the vignettes, um, they lead to, uh, to more connected campaign play, even with operations that are completely unrelated it it still lends itself to follow the same characters into into their different operations and such but there's other styles of campaigns that are long running uh storylines um something like you you talked to us last time that you're working on impossible landscapes and that sounds like it's a like a straightforward long form story uh for agents to um yeah yeah i wouldn't even call that straightforward but uh (laughs) If you like Night Floors, Night Floors is one of the operations in Impossible Landscapes. Um, so it's an entire campaign built around the King and Yellow. So it's 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 as big as the Handler's Guide. <laughs> it got that big, huh? Holy moly. I remember last time you said it was going to be like 100 and something pages. In it's bigger than that. It's, it's 180,000 <laughs> words, which is about the Handler's Guide. Um, and it's in layout now. Uh, if you like it, if you'd like to take a look at it, you can join... My Patreon for as little as a buck, and the entire manuscript is there. By the way, speaking of your Patreon, um, so I'm I'm one of your patrons, and uh, it's I love your Patreon. You're so you're so open about the process, and it really is. Um, it sheds light into everything that you know, all the steps that you go through. You share a lot of art with us, and you share even full on like chapters. <laughs> of certain things. Yeah, no, um, it's great to have such a direct conduit with um, the the people who love this stuff and to get feedback from them. uh, The feedback is almost always useful or actionable. It's never just, oh, I hate this or, and you know, it's it's very rarely anything remotely like that. Most of the time, it's just an awesome interaction. And I, I really look forward to posting these things and seeing people kind of get back to me on them. Um, and, and, you know, often we get a lot of help from people who are experts in lots of random, oh, I work in a, you know, a museum. Here's how this is handled. And we work it oh. into the, we work it into the game and it makes the final product infinitely better. That's awesome. Collective minds. It sounds like an operation title. Yeah. <laughs> right. It does actually. Right. <laughs> well, um, if you guys are interested in joining Dennis's Patreon, we will link it in the in the show notes as well. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention Impossible Landscapes is going to be the first campaign for Delta Green ever. Um, and it, it's enormous and terrifying and fun and cool. And it all focuses on the madness uh, that the book, The King in Yellow, re, you know, uh, sets upon the world. And it's, it's truly surreal horror. It's a very different type of horror. And it's... It's quite fun. Um, I've run it four times now, and a bunch of people have run it independently, and it's gotten really high marks. So I'm really excited about it. Yeah, we are too. We're huge fans of the King in Yellow. So yeah, yeah, we played Night Floors for the channel, and uh, nice. So you could pick you could pick up right from the end of Night Floors. There's another three operations in there that follow. <laughs> I think one person survived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My character certainly did not live at the end of that. <laughs> That's pretty, it's pretty, com- pretty common outcome. 
Uh, there are, <laughs> there are, there are options for that too. Yeah. Night floors remains one of my all time favorites. It was, it was really, really fun, but we're, we're really liking ex oblivione too. That one is, uh, yeah, yeah that's a great, right. that's a great scenario. Shane's got some really good ones. It's completely different, uh, than, than something like night floors, but it, in it, in its own way, it's really great too. Oh wait, no, ex oblivione is me. I wrote Yeah, that, that was yours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy working on impossible landscapes. You guys don't even understand, man. Like people will be like, "Oh, you you said this in this book," and I'm like, "No, I didn't." And then they, you know, and then I go read it. And I'm like, "Holy crap, I did!" Huh? Well, I guess I guess I should probably remember that. There's just too many words. Um, if you guys haven't heard our interview with Dennis that we did a few months ago, check it out on the Great Old Ones website. We'll link it in the in the notes for this one as well. And uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Dennis, thank you so much for being on the show. Great fun. Anytime. And uh, again, we'll, we'll link your Patreon in the show notes. And um, as always, I am Innkeeper Vase Odin. And with me today was... I'm Nate, lost in time and space. <laughs> I'm Dennis. And- hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we'll talk to you guys real soon.